Is it in church? Yeah, I think it's on. Is it not on? Let's. Okay, it says it's on. Okay. All right. Well, let's turn to Ephesians 4. <clears throat> We're going through the transition chapter uh, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And since most everybody that's here today has been through all of this, I'm not going to do the background part of it like I normally would. Um, other than to say Paul's basic style was the first half of his letters is theological or doctrinal, and the last half is usually application of how do you put what he's been teaching you in the first part into action in real life. Because uh, from Paul's perspective, uh, doctrine and behavior should match. So there shouldn't be a great uh, separation between what a person professes to believe and how they actually live. Because the truth is, how we live reflects what we actually believe. We may assume we believe some things, but our behavior may be revealing something totally different. Uh, you know, if someone says, well, I'm a person of faith, but then they're in the middle of a crunch where faith is really needed and they're falling apart. Well, they're not a person of faith. They may want to be, but that's not who they are at that moment. So Paul is very mindful of the fact that behavior, lifestyle, should match doctrine, should match beliefs, the espoused beliefs uh, of the church in particular. Now in chapter 4, he starts going through a long list of things, characteristics of someone who is uh, a new creation in Christ. And a lot of times when you're reading in scriptures and they go get into list, it's easy to get lost because it, it's kind of like if, if someone were to say to you, uh, quick, name all 50 states. And you know, and you go, uh, well, number one, number two. Number... So it's real easy with, if you have a lot of information, you just kind of throw it all into um, pro, uh, a narrative like this to kind of get lost in the list. So that's why I put the chart on the board of uh, what he's going to call put off and put on. And remember the words put off, put on are descriptive of taking off a coat. So take off your old coat, which is the old self, and put on your new coat, which is the new self. Okay, Now, before I get into that, though, I want to remind us, because sometimes... Uh, I don't know why it does this, but I, other than maybe people teach it, I'm not sure. But sometimes when you read the Bible, you assume that whatever you're reading, the person wrote to everyone. And that's not true. Okay? So Ephesians was written to people living in Ephesus and was probably a circular letter that was going to go throughout Asia Minor and hit the major cities in Asia Minor. But the letter was written to whom? Christians. Okay. So it's good to remember that because sometimes uh, people will get into a list of what should be or characteristics of Christians or what being a new creation looks like, and they try to apply that to lost people, and it doesn't work. Because to lost people, the truth of Scripture is foolishness. That's what Paul said. Paul said to the, those who are uh, lost, those who are deceived, to them, the scripture's veiled, and it's foolishness. It makes no sense. And so if we try to impose Christian standards on non-Christian people, it never works. And they're going to rebel. All right, so keep in mind as he goes through this, and we're going to go through some of these. The first part we're going to review, just to kind of get it all in a, in a context. But he's speaking to Christians. Not lost folks. 
Not everybody. He's speaking to Christians. So he said, verse 17, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord. In other words, I'm making a command. It's imperative. It isn't up for debate or for discussion. Um, that you must no longer live, okay? So for him to say you must no longer live as the Gentiles, what does that indicate? They were living as the Gentiles, even though they were Christians, okay? So he's got to straighten out this problem because there's a big inconsistency between what they profess to believe and what they model they really believe. Okay? So he's going to deal with that gap. He said, so you've got to stop living like the Gentiles do. In the futility, the worthlessness, the meaninglessness of their thinking. Now, I don't know about you, but it, you know what I see looking around at some of the quote-unquote wisdom the world uh, it just seems to get dumber and dumber and I'm not trying to be critical I mean it just sometimes I mean it's, it's dumb enough for, for it would be dumb for me to get up here and say you know I'm a 20 year old anorexic female <laughs> now if you sat there and said okay I can go along with that you're as dumb as me because that's not true. Reality is nowhere near that. But sometimes if, if you know, I've, I've been watching Charlie Kirk, who's one of the best at dealing with folks on this. Uh, they'll, they'll hit him with that. Well, what? Who are you to say I can't be going? You know, well, whatever. And he said, well, okay. Uh, has, has your, have your genetics changed? Your basic genetic structure changed? No. Uh, well, if you're in the, and he was talking to one guy the other day, he was a, uh, paramedic but he was trying to be a girl and all that kind of stuff and uh, so he was all defensive about it and so he said well I'll tell you what you're a paramedic right he said yeah I'm a paramedic. so if you get a call to a male uh, who's in distress and you go to pick him up and when you pick him up then he tells you I'm in distress because I'm having a miscarriage <laughs> are you going to check him and the guy said uh Forget it, and you turn around and walk off. <laughs> but see, that's futility of their thinking. And that's not the only thing. I mean, I always laugh when one of these Hollywood types that thinks they're still famous, but they're really not, uh, say, well, if so-and-so gets elected, I'm leaving the country. Well, you know what I say to that? Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> I, I guess that's supposed to make me say, oh, no. You're going to leave the country. Oh, my goodness. What are we going to do? I say don't let the door hit you on the way out. But they really think they're doing something. That's the futility of their thinking. Yeah, and they never leave. Please go. It's okay with us if you go. Nobody's going to miss you. Uh, I saw a little clip from a young girl, woman. I won't call her a lady. I'll call her a woman. Uh, boy, she was just ranting and raving going on. She said, the day I get pregnant is the day I'm going to kill myself. And if I can't have an abortion, I'm going to kill myself and two people will die. How you going to like that? Well, wait a minute. Two People will die? You sure it wasn't a person and a fetus, which is an impersonal thing? No, she said two people were going to die. How are you going to like that? Well, that would be sad, but I don't know you, honey. But that, see, that's that futility of their thinking. They, they think the world's all about them. It just revolves around them. So, you know, uh, it's not even a contest anymore. When you see how futile the thinking of people has become. Now, they were just as bad in Paul's day. 
Because in Paul's day, they would worship most anything. And with that worship always came debauchery of every type. Immorality, whatever you want to do, do it. Kind of like our phrase today people use, you do you. And so he's saying, guys, you got to stop. You can't live this way. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Again, key phrase. For him to say due to the hardening of their hearts, what's he implying? They did it. They hardened their hearts. It didn't just happen. They chose it. Having lost all sensitivity, that means their conscience has died. Uh, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in Him accordant, in accordance with the truth that is in Christ, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. So one of the things we're to put off is our old self. He said, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. That's your worldview. So when someone comes to Christ... We, everybody needs a worldview reformation. Because when we come to Christ, He saves our spirit in an instant. That's when we're justified, made right with God. But then He begins the process of saving our soul. And that's worldview reformation. Because when we come to God, we come to God with a worldview that is screwed up by the world. It's been programmed by the world. That's the futility of the mind, the futility of the, of the thinking. We come to God all messed up because the world has programmed us to believe certain things about life, to believe certain things about ourselves, to believe certain things about God. And when that happens, we have to have that stuff changed but here's the thing it may not change overnight and I say that because of this this week I've seen three different testimonies of people who got saved that most folks thought could never get saved one of them was a couple well three different th units okay four people one was a couple this couple was deeply involved in an <clears throat> alternative lifestyle that uh, some folks just finished celebrating in June to the point they had transitioned. And they got under conviction. The Holy Spirit got them under conviction because they were so empty on the inside. Their lives had no purpose, no meaning, they got under conviction. They saw that where, the way they were going was never going to work. It was always going to lead to disaster and more emptiness. They cried out to God. God saved them. You know what? All that thinking didn't change overnight. i tell you what they said did change overnight. Their desire. And so they detransitioned. So they could live as a normal husband and wife. Now, is their theology perfect? No. But I tell you what was very perfect was their pure love for God and their hunger for God. And they found a church that would welcome them before they got saved. And they were just looking 
for something. In fact, the girl said when they first started going to church there, everybody thought she was a guy. And they started inviting her to all the guy things. And uh, finally they said, no, she's a girl. And she's going to look more like one in the future. And here's some more news. They had a baby. And she had found out that day she was pregnant again. And they love the Lord. They're serving the Lord in that church. They're reaching out to other people who are in that lifestyle who are wanting to get out. Now, some of the things they said were not stuff we'd probably say. But you know what? If someone will work with them a little bit, all that will be taken care of. Ignorance is the easiest problem to fix. Second one, young lady who's in the adult entertainment business, made a lot of money, very successful, living large, had a huge mansion out in Beverly Hills, sports car, everything you could want, eat up with loneliness, emptiness. And she said one night she was sitting there thinking, Said she hadn't prayed in years and she said, God, there's got to be more to life than this. I am miserable. And then she remembered there was a Bible on her bookshelf that her mother had given her before she went into that lifestyle. And she just had it on the bookshelf to help with the decor of her living room. And she pulled that Bible down, started reading it, came under conviction, surrendered her heart to the Lord, shut down her Adult, ed, edu, uh, adult education, adult, adult entertainment business. Got married. Found a church home. She said the first time she went to church, after she first got saved, she was sitting there and they were having a baptismal service. Said the Holy Spirit got a hold of her and said, you get down there right now and get baptized. And she said, but I'm not, I didn't bring any clothes to change or nothing. I don't care. Go get baptized. She got up and she ran down to the front because they were baptizing other people. Said they'd already gotten done and the preacher had come out and changed his clothes. And she said, I have got to be baptized today. He said, okay. So he went by there and put his wet clothes on. They found some clothes in the back, got her some stuff to wear, and she got baptized that day. She's loving the Lord today. She's reaching out to other girls who were in that industry she was in. Now, did she talk Bible that day like she'd been in church 20 years? No. In that interview, you know, she said some things. And I was like, oh, she'll get it. If somebody will work with her, she'll get it. And the last one is a comedian from England. And his name just slipped me. What, do you remember his name? Russell Brand. This was one of the most foul-mouthed, drug-using, alcohol-drinking, I mean, hedonistic to the core. He would get on the Internet just to show his hedonism. The Lord got a hold of him. Got under conviction. Got saved. He's always flashing pictures of when he got baptized. And a creek somewhere. And now, if you turn on the podcast I saw this week, he's preaching. He's, in fact, he'll get on, he said, today I was reading in Ephesians where it talks about Prince Paul, and, and he's just going, what do you guys think about that? Now, is his language perfect? No. I mean, he encouraged his viewers the other day, if you're just wanting a feeling, go drink or do some drugs. I ain't talking about feelings. I'm talking, I said, well, that's probably not the best uh, instruction to give in a, in a Bible lesson, but okay. But you know what? If somebody will work with him just a little, he'll get it. That's the kind of folks God's saving right now. Those that most folks think can't be. In Jesus' day, they were called 
notorious sinners. Now, it's one thing to be a sinner, but to be called a notorious sinner, that's a whole different thing. So put off the old self. And he said, and to be made new in the attitude of your mind, so we all need a worldview reformation. I mean, just about the time you think you got God all figured out, he'll throw a left ball, a left hook. He'll come at you with something. You say, oh, my goodness, I've never seen that before. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self. Kept created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, so within the context of putting off the old self, putting on the new self, do this. Put off falsehood. Okay, if you remember last week, we said falsehood is being deceitful or telling lies, but it's also the word refers to fake religion. Get rid of your fake religion. And instead, put on truthfulness. Okay? And he goes on to say, uh, speaking truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Again, he's talking to Christians. So it's sad when you got to tell a bunch of Christians, stop lying. Then he goes on to say, in your anger, do not sin. All right, did he say don't get angry? No. He's talking about, to make it easy, I'll just say rage. Because when you go off in a rage, are you likely to do something productive or negative? Negative. You're just out for damage. You're just inflicting pain or harm or something. So get out of rage. But anger can be a positive thing if it motivates righteous behavior. So... I'm just going to say use anger for righteousness. Every social justice cause, doing away with slavery, uh, everything else that's happened began because somebody got angry with it. And they channeled it in a productive way. And then he explains why. You know, uh, deal with it quickly because you don't want to give the devil a foothold. And then today he says in verse uh, 20, I don't have my eyes on, 29, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. So stop stealing. Now, who's he talking to here? Lost folks, right? Christians, stop stealing. And instead, go to work. Now, the implication here is he's referring not so much to people coming into the church and pulling a gun and saying, give me your wallet. But what he's talking about is people who are mooching off of others, which was a big problem. In, in churches then, and a lot of times they would do it because uh, someone in the church would say, you know, I just spend my days in prayer and study and getting revelations from God, but my light bill's due and I need somebody to pay it for me. And so it would be that kind of mooching is what I'm talking about. And so his solution there is go to work. Find something productive to do. And then you will have money to give to someone else in their time of need. Now, I want to focus on that one today just for a moment. What he's talking about here, or, or maybe he didn't have it in mind, but we can make the segue with it, is this. Do you remember 
in, um, let's see if I can find it. Well, in 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul is talking about the need for churches to take care of their own civil affairs. Do y'all remember that? Okay, you don't, so I'm going to read it to you. Doing the segue this way. All right, he said, for, if, you're, if you are stealing, stop stealing. Notice he didn't say, if stealing is going on in the church, call the police. Now, sometimes churches won't call the police when they need to. Like when all these little kids are getting messed with by preachers and staff people. That's when they need to be calling police, but they won't. Paul here is dealing with civil matters. And so he said, if someone's stealing, you guys need to take care of that yourself. Don't call in the authorities. You deal with it. And, uh, and he does it. He talks about that in 1 Corinthians 6, verse uh, 1 through 11. And he says, if any of you have a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? There's your good end times verse. The Lord's people will judge the world. And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that you will judge angels? There's another good end times verse. How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, civil type disputes, disagreements, lawsuits, do you ask for a ruling from those, now notice this sentence here, whose way of life is scorned in the church? In other words, if you're going to be judging people in, in the last day and in angels, can't you take care of your own business? Why are you going to drag this stuff into a civil court to get a ruling from people who do not share your worldview? That's a good question. And yet it happens all the time. Churches go to court for this, that, and the other. Uh, there was a church in Dothan not long ago that was in court trying to keep the preacher out. We have churches fighting over buildings. All kinds of stuff going on. And so he said, don't, get, don't do that. Don't put your business out there for everybody like that. Because look at verse 5. I say this to shame you. What? Paul wants to shame them? Yeah. He said, I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another to court and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means what? You have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were not are. This is who you used to be. So stop acting like it. But you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 
So why then, if that's the case, if he's saying when you have disputes in the church, resolve it there. Don't go to civil authorities to resolve it. Why doesn't that happen? It wasn't it? Greed? Oh. Uh, there's many reasons why it could happen. That's why I was, I, it wasn't a trick question. Why do you think that happens? If, if Paul said do this, but people won't, I mean, you, you have a lot of church that won't even practice quote-unquote discipline anymore. Why? Simple reason. The church has no authority anymore. See, if, if, I, if there was something that, that broke out between two people here and you got sideways with each other and couldn't work it out between the two of you and, and you said, well, we're going to take it before the church and let the church decide. And then the church hears it and they decide. The one who was decided against would say, well, I'm out of here. I'll see you all later. Happens all the time. I've known of staff people who got in some kind of trouble and the church was trying to deal with them, trying to save them if possible from more trouble, more destruction. And they just, on you, I'm going down the road where they won't bother me. And they go down the road and they get a new position. See, churches don't do that anymore because no one respects the authority of the church anymore. Because what's happened, and one time I heard someone describe the church this way, and I think it's, it's still true in many places, is they describe the church as a voluntary association of like-minded people. So if things aren't going right, that's okay. There's one down there. There's one across the road. There's several up that way. One over here. So there's no authority. Now it wasn't that way when Paul was writing. When Paul was writing, there was only one church per town. Now, they might meet in different places, multiple locations, but there was one. And if you were kicked out of one, you were kicked out of all. There was no, well, I'll see y'all, I'm going down the road. And then down the road says, hey, come on in. Yeah, boy, we're glad to have you. Yeah, you caused all kinds of trouble down there, but that's down there. That's not here. But that's why that doesn't happen. You see... Jesus called the church. Well, what did he call the church? I'm going to give you a quiz. What did Jesus call the church? It was a word. Huh? Well, there's a Greek word. Ecclesia. Now, yeah, you were hitting all the big ones, but the word we were looking for, notice when he talks about the church and he said, this is the church and this church, Church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Okay? The word is ecclesia. Now, he could have chosen any word. Jesus could have said, you know, I think the word for church is going to be retirement center. So our emphasis is going to be just get folks in here and just kind of retire on life. Wait on God and enjoy it. Or we can be the uh, perpetual hospital where you come in wounded and beat up by life and 30 years later you're still going to be coming in wounded and beat up by life. But hey, you're in a good place because we're never going to challenge you. We're just going to comfort you, tell you how wonderful you are, try to build you up this week, give you some stimulating music to get you inspired, let you have a good ex existential experience with goosebumps. 
He's going to tell you some warm, fuzzy stories from the pulpit about how great you are. And, Ooh, God's so lucky to have you. And one of these days, it's finally going to work for you. He could have said it was that. He could have said uh, it's a treatment center. So that's, that's the idea of, you know, the only people the gospel really appeals to is people that are all laden down with troubles and problems and they can't seem to get a leg up. And so everything's geared towards them, uh, which means, which is okay to, to want to help people. But what, mean, what that means is anybody who's not beat down, heavy laden, they feel like life's pretty well under control and everything's going great. We ain't got nothing for you. He didn't call it any of that. He called it an ecclesia. And when he said ecclesia, that group knew what he meant. An ecclesia was a group of citizens in the Greek city-states, or the polis of the Greek city-state, who was called out or elected to rule. They administrated the city. They took care of government decisions. They took care of administrative decisions. They took care of legal decisions. They took care of all of it. Isn't it interesting that Jesus called us that? He didn't call us a treatment center, hospital, retirement home, charity. He called us the ecclesia. So since we are the ecclesia, what Paul is saying is put off this idea of running to court all the time and put on, here's the solution. So you got somebody stealing in the church, instead of calling the police in, just put them to work. Resolve the issue. Because if you'll put them to work, and like I said, in context, it appears he's talking about folks who are just mooching off the church or mooching off other people. He's saying, tell them to go to work. And when they go to work, they'll start making a living and they'll have money to help somebody else who's in need. So all that's part of putting off and putting on. And all of that is part of being a new creation in Christ. Well, we'll stop there for today. Any questions about anything? Well, I hope this week that we will consider Paul's words here. To put off and put on. Because you may find that if you ask God, God show me what in me is needing to be put off. He may show some things that you weren't expecting. And please note, Paul didn't say God will do it for you. He'll help you if you ask but he's not going to get do it for you. We have to do it. And we do it under his strength, but we have to do it because most of what we have to put off is behavior. And the only way to change behavior is to replace it with a different behavior. And it takes practice for that behavior to take root. Father, I thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you've given us the blueprint for how to live this Christian life as you designed it to be. And so help us, Lord, to see that there's no future in trying to live like the Gentiles. That if anything, their condition is getting worse. There's no advantages. 
but help us to be confident in you and in your truth and in what you've said to do. Help us, Lord, to be mindful of what in our life might need to be put off. Things that maybe we've carried with us for years and maybe we found ways to justify or felt justified in holding on to. But you say they have to go. Help us, Lord, to know what to put off and help us to know what to put on. Show us the truth. Show us how to apply the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.